Hi, I'm Selena Lovett from Annie's Bookstop of Worcester, and I'm here with Tony L.P. Kellner and also uh, Lee Perry. And uh, she is actually a mystery writer, a cozy mystery writer. And um, I'd like your actual definition, if you could, of a cozy mystery. Um, I, 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 honestly, a cozy mystery, my short version is, is less Sam Spade and more Ms. Marple or more Jessica Fletcher for people who are more familiar with TV. It's almost defined by what it's not. It's not a lot of violence. It's not a lot of naughty language. And it's not a lot of sex. And that's pretty much, you know, and there's, there's a lot of tropes that show up in cozy small towns. But I've seen cozies that were just in small neighborhoods instead. Um, it's, you know, often a single woman, but I've seen married couples. I mean, the, the, as long as you keep the, the, the sex, language, and violence kind of off screen, I, to me, that counts as a cozy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. So, I mean, it seems like even uh, younger readers um, could, could read it. Could read, oh, like, absolutely. Teen, teens I did some, and... was reading a bunch of YA books for a project a while back, and it's been a couple of years now. And I was thinking, I could never write YA because I don't use enough cuss words and I don't have enough violence. I, I mean, when you look at the, the catching, the Mockingjay series, and it's like, whoa, that stuff's way more violent than anything I've ever written. Ah, you know, that's right. That's true. Very, very, very true. Hmm. I know when I was young, forget it. <laughs> <laughs> but that's neither here nor there. Uh, okay, so what can um, what can readers expect from from your books? Well, my current series is the Family Skeleton series, and I want to put it right out front that the skeleton is not metaphorical. He is a skeleton. It's um it's about Georgia Thackeray, who's a adjunct English professor and a single mother. She moves back home to has to with house sitting for her parents and has to deal with the family skeleton up in the attic. And he's a skeleton. His name is Sid, and he walks and he talks, and he's been Georgia's best friend since she was about six years old. Um, in the course of the book, he runs across someone he remembers from when he was kind of more traditionally alive. Uh, and they start to solve it, they go after his own murder. He has very few since he has so no memories of his life as a human. This is the first time he's recognized anything, and this is when they realize he was murdered all those many years ago. Uh huh. And from that so point it, on, the two of them saw crimes together. So the series is all about him trying to find out who murdered him. Well, no, they saw his murder in the first book, and after that, they kind of they develop a taste for it. Ah, for solving murders. For solving murders. So okay. there's six books the, and one short story in the series so far, and I'm working on the seventh book. Wonderful. So what do you think draws readers to these kinds of books? Skeleton books? I don't know. Um, cozies in general. I think it was Dorothy Sayers who said that uh, mysteries are the most moral of fiction because the bad guy is found out. Uh, and sometimes he's punished by the, you know, by the courts. Sometimes there's you know, something more. He gets killed himself. He's just exposed or whatever but the bad guy is found out in cozies particularly um i tend to think of that a murder is just is um attacking the order of a, of a of a neighborhood of a family of a group of people and that in solving the murder it's bringing order back to the chaos and that's very comforting and mm -hmm. i think and also with cozies i think it's comforting to people I mean, I find it comforting that it's not, you know, these train just the trained professionals doing it. It's not just your PIs and not just your tough guys and tough gals solving it. It's kind of normal people. It makes okay. you it makes them feel more empowered, I think. Okay. Empowered. So, okay. So what was the inspiration for your uh, family skeleton series? You know, I I feel like there should have been some Eureka moment where I saw a, a show, in, in, there are a few other books that have a skeleton type character. And I thought, I'm just going to do a mystery with that. In fact, I don't know where it came from. I was between series, as they say, which is to say, I had finished my first series written as Tony Kellner, which was a Southern Mysteries as, as a Laura Fleming series. And I was trying to sell what ended up being my second series. But there was a time when I wasn't sure the second series was going to sell. And I'm like, well, what's, what's, going on in cozies. I'd like to do something paranormal because I've, I've been reading a lot of paranormal urban fantasy and paranormal mysteries. I said, well, what can I do? I said, I can't do vampires because my pal Charlene Harris pretty much has the vampires locked up. 
I'm not going to do wearables because my pal Dana Cameron, she's got the wearables down cold and I don't want to compete with them. And I started trying to think of what hadn't been done. And I knew of ghosts and witches and wizards and ghost cats and angels and just, in fact, two series with angels and all these different things. And I go, okay, what can I do that hasn't been done? And some weird voice in my head said, no one's done a walking, talking skeleton. Because why would anyone have done a walking, talking skeleton? So I sat down and I wrote the first maybe three or four pages kind of introducing the relationship between Sid and Georgia. And those pages with very few modifications ended up being in the first book because Sid popped out just the way he was going to be kind of making bad bone jokes and being kind of silly. And I I shifted Georgia a little bit as as I was writing the series, but Sid just popped out and there he was. Mm-hmm. Okay. So what kind of research went into to writing? Um, what, what is your latest book? Your latest book is... Uh, the current one I'm working on the, or the most recent that published? Whichever you'd like to talk about. Well, let's see. The most recent, the one I'm working on is, and I don't even have a title yet. I've gone back and forth between, it's got to be the skeleton verbs and noun, because that's, you know, skeleton the first one, first one is family skeleton, or skeleton in the family, but the other was, you know, the skeleton haunts the house, and the skeleton, right, uh, uh, makes a friend, so it's got to be, does something to something, so I'm working on either the skeleton swings a sword, or the skeleton casts a spell, because it's going to be set at a LARP camp, and I don't know if you know what LARP is, it's live action role play, mm-hmm. I think of it as kind of like D&D brought to life. And it's usually, you can do a LARP really in any kind of setting. My husband used to do games of them. They called them something different than set around all kinds of settings from Shakespeare to Watergate to one was kind of set inside a person's body and all the parts of her body trying to keep her healthy. Kind of this fantastic voyage kind of thing. It was hilarious. Um, But most of them have a kind of a fantasy thing. And my daughter was a member who went to a LARP camp in Burlington, Massachusetts, uh, for many years. And so I'm kind of using that, that Georgia, she's an, an English professor, but during the summer, she's got time off. And as an adjunct professor, she's always trying to get a little extra money. And her daughter's getting old enough that she's going to be heading for college. So Georgia's working at a LARP camp. And her daughter is there as, as, a, uh, as a camper as well. And so I've been, for that one, I've been mainly picking my daughter's brain from, when you were at LARP camp, how did this work? Wait, when you were at LARP camp, how did that work? Um, I, I worry my daughters to death a lot. Um, and so when I wrote The Skeleton Paints a Picture, which was set as an art school, my other daughter was in art, went to an art college. So, yep, I got to pick all her stories for that. Um, but then sometimes I'll have to do weird research, like, Oh, let's see. What have I had to do for this one? I remember at one point trying to, how do you tell the difference between uh, an actual skeleton and something like a very good cla- plaster cast? And the way mm. to do it, you lick it. Really? Because a, a bone is actually a little bit porous. It may not look it, but it's actually a bit porous. And since it's porous, your tongue kind of sticks to it. Not like sticks to it, like forever like a piece of tape but just a little adherence to it and that won't happen with a plaster cast which is less porous Ooh, isn't that I, a little... I have not gone around licking skeletons to check on this because you know if it's got a seam in it i'm going to assume it's plastic and just let it go with that isn't that a little uh unsanitary well you know that's what i thought but the, the my aforementioned uh, friend dana cameron who was a describes herself as a recovering archaeologist she said that actually they would, when they had fragments of little bits and stuff, they would actually stick their tongue on it. And, and she's still alive, so I guess it's okay. <laughs> wow. It doesn't strike me as a good time either. So what is your favorite research story that you ever had? Okay, this was for something totally different. This wasn't Sid at all. Um, okay. Years back, I was writing a short story. And I wanted, as not to happen in the story, but to, as kind of background, that a dog had been murdered, poisoned with antifreeze. I don't know about oh. you, but I've heard for years that when you change the antifreeze in your car, don't leave it out because the neighborhood dogs and cats will drink it and get sick. Mm-hmm. Like, okay, but I didn't know 
how much or what the symptoms would be or anything like that and or why they would drink it and i found out and so i um did enough to find out research to find out that it tastes good to dogs and cats oddly enough hmm. i don't know there's something in it um but i went on a there was a a, a listserv back in the serve day because this was a long time ago and they had um an ask a vet line you could ask vet questions about your dogs and your cats and your guinea pigs or whatever and so i went on I said, you know, explain, I'm writing this mystery. I gave them my bona fides that I had published books and stories before that I needed this first story. And this woman got on and said, well, I'll tell you, it really just takes a mouthful, but I'm not going to give you any of the details about the symptoms or anything, because how do I know you're not planning to kill a dog? And all I could think of, you know, I wasn't even offended in the normal sense. I was just like, woman, if I wanted to kill a dog, Number one, I've got a car. I don't need an antifreeze. Number two, if I wanted to kill a dog with antifreeze for some reason, I wouldn't care how much it took. I'd just keep feeding it to it until it died. I could be very empirical. I, if I was going to do it for real, I didn't need the research. But she was sure I was you know, a serial killer practicing on puppy dogs. Fortunately, <laughs> an actual vet stepped on and said, okay, here's the, here's the answer. It only takes a little bit. These are the symptoms, blah, blah. And I did not kill a dog. No, I would imagine not. God. So that was pretty funny. Actually, I've got, I've got one more, if you don't mind. This is yeah. another short story. Um, the Mystery Writers of America was doing an anthology of legal, of courtroom drama short stories. And I mm -hmm. want to submit, and I don't know anything about courtroom drama. And I, I know we have a lot of lawyer mystery writers. It's like, yeah, I'm not going, I'm not competing with that. Mm -hmm. um, but I had a, I have had this idea for a long time about a mystery set aboard a pirate ship in the golden age of piracy. And I'm going to say this was not so much realistic pirates as it was watching too many pirate movies growing up. But still, but I was doing my research about pirates. And I, the, the gimmick was that a guy was a lawyer. He was going to be on the pirate ship and he'd been captured and being forced to go through this mock court because one of the uh, pirates has been accused of murder, which you would think is funny because don't all pirates kill, but there's rules by which they can kill. Mm -hmm. And it, the, the golden age of piracy, a pirate crew had to sign a bunch of rules that they called the ship's articles. And we have a few copies of ship's articles that, that uh, survive to this day. So we know what the rules were. And it was like, who gets how much plunder and don't bring any you know women on board, do this, don't do that. They had that all set out. And I thought, well, if someone broke that, that's going to be a breaking a law. And um, they would have to have some way of determining who was guilty and wasn't. But I thought, well, they're just going to do a little fake court. And I'm thinking, it's kind of silly, but what the heck? So I'm reading up on pirates, and I was looking at the very learned tome, Pirates for Dummies. And, and, I was, and it goes to this point, it says, when a ship was becalmed or there were no targets, one of the things pirates would actually do for fun and entertainment was to do fake admiralty courts where they would pretend you're going to be the prosecutor and you're going to be the thing and they would and you get to be the fake hangman and all this to practice and to play court and to convict one another because their theory was that sooner or later most of them would probably end up in admiralty court so they better know what the rules were and they sometimes knew the rules better than the actual lawyers and so forth involved because they had practiced so much. And I'm like, I can actually have this fake courtroom scene on my in my story, and it's actually kind of true to life. Oh wow! Is that what you would call that a treasure chest. <laughs> of, of <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> that was that made me very happy, as you might imagine. I can I can I can imagine. The story did not sell to that anthology, but it published elsewhere, so it's okay. Oh, good. Okay. So what was the biggest challenge that you had in writing and, and putting out your um, your uh, Family Skeleton series? Biggest challenge? I think it was just kind of believing it in myself. This sounds so silly. But I, it lived on my computer those first few pages for about 10 years. Because my series, you know, I said I was waiting to see if another series sold, and that was my Where Are They Now series. And it did sell. So I did three books in that. And I was also doing some anthologies with Charlotte. So I was staying busy. And um, somewhere in there, you know, that series came to an end. And I was like, well, I better 
pitch something else, both for a new agent and a new editor, both. Um, actually, the same editor, but still have something to pitch. And I put together all these pitches of things that have been kind of in my idea that in my back of my head would be fun to write. And I had, I think, seven. No, I had I had six. I don't know. I wanted I would wanted to round up the number, and I had an odd number. And I'm like, well, Steve, I was going to pitch this and this, Steve being my husband, I'm sorry. And he said, well, what about that skeleton then? Throw that in too, and it'll be an even number. Like, no one's going to buy me a bunch of skeleton making bad jokes. I put it in, what the heck? So I put it in, and so I handed these five or six um, one page proposals to my agent, or to the guy I wanted to be my agent. And he's looking them over, he goes, yeah, this one's, I could, I could really see a series out of this. This would be very promising. I want the skeleton. Like, seriously? He goes, well, you know, go to the editor first and see what she wants. Because he says, you know, I'll, I'll rep you whichever one it was, but I think the skeleton's different. It'll be good. And I'm like, okay. And I was kind of happy, but I was also like, really? So I take the, the same stack of, stories, of proposals to my agent, to the editor at, um, at Ace Books slash Berkeley. And she's going through them and says, oh, yeah, I like this one's interesting. I haven't seen this before. I want the skeleton. <laughs> so so the, almost the biggest challenge was believing that anyone would want them. And also, oh, wow. with, with any amateur sleuth, you've got the how do you get him involved? You know, especially with the first book. Um, and, you know, how do you get uh, an amateur who's not a cop, not a PI, not a reporter, or sometimes you can use a reporter, but my character is not involved in, in what special knowledge can they use? And that's when you then you're throwing in someone who cannot be seen by the rest of the world with Sid. I mean, no one else knows he exists um, except for Georgia, her daughter, her sister, her parents. Um, and, you know, maybe in the course of the series, more people will find out. I will say nothing. But basically, it's a small group of people. So everything he does has to be, he's got to be hidden. He's got to be dressed as something else. Like um, in the second book, uh, whose name? I can't remember that. That's silly. But he um, he's playing Yorick in a production of Hamlet. So he's the skull they hold up. So he's backstage <laughs> and can hear things. All these, in the, uh, the one I'm working on now, which is again set at the LARP camp, he is playing a life-size puppet of the death card in a tarot deck. And it, it made to look as if George is kind of moving him and actually, no, he's moving on his own. But, so all, you know, how can I get him in there to see things and hear things? So that's the biggest challenge going overall. In one book, uh -huh. he's a model for an art class, you know. How can I get him there and get him to do something other than sit on the computer all day, which he's really good at. So all that computer stuff, which is really something a lot of private eyes and cops use, but it's not really that exciting to write about. I can say, well, overnight I did all of this, Sid, so I can just give all the reports afterwards. Oh, that's great. Great makeup he's wearing, right? <laughs> yes. He dressed up, he did cosplay in the very first book. He dressed up as a character from the... Uh, uh, manga and anime called Soul Eater, Eater, because my daughters know that salt anime and manga, so I can uh, pluck their brains for anything like that. More research, <laughs> more research. I've always been a big fan of doing research by what I can steal from my family. Um, when my first series, there was one book set at the flea market. My mother was a flea market dealer for many years, uh -huh. and so I just got a bunch of her stories. Oh wow. So I, I think I probably know the answer to this one, but I may not be. It may not be the right answer. Um, what character did you love or hate the most and why? You mean in, in, in my In book? any of your stories, yeah. In any now, of your you stories. Know, there really, other than the villains, there aren't that many I hate. Um, I think my three protagonists kind of represent me at different points of my life. Huh. Okay, the, the, the Laura Fleming series is about a, nor a southerner, large eccentric extended family much like my own large extended except really eccentric family um who had moved up north and married a northerner you know if only one her generation go to college and that a lot of that was very much like me and i found with mystery writers their first series is often a lot like them so you know she was in, in tech field i mean i made her a little different i made her tall which is to say she's five foot two which is tall in my family <laughs> Um, you know, her her husband was in, is in academia, which we thought my husband was going to go to academia. He actually left the halls of academia a long time ago. 
Um, but, you know, all these things that were me, so it was me as kind of a young married person. Um, dealing with, you know, this, this dichotomy of being from the South but not living there, going back down there. And it's her home, but it's not her home anymore. And I felt that very strongly. So that was kind of, and also kind of introducing the South. And it wasn't until I left the South and moved to Massachusetts. I grew up in North Carolina. Um, and moved in, then I realized kind of what the differences were. And also, there's a lot about the South I'm not crazy about, but there's a lot of that's really pretty fun and nifty. So I was kind of introducing that. So that was where I was when I was writing those, um, ended up being eight books and a, and a book's worth of short stories. Mm. And then I was doing the Tilda Harper series, which right. are Where Are They Now series, which is set around Massachusetts in Malden, in which I could actually drive around to parts of Malden and see where her apartments were. Because part of her thing was that she could never, she kept swifting roommates. She just couldn't find a roommate she could put up with or who would put up with her. Um, and, you know, she was snarkier and, and she was a little bit, oddly enough, she was younger rather than older, but that was kind of that more cynical side of me and also the fan part of me because she specialized in articles about people who used to be famous. And I love TV trivia. I love movie trivia. Um, I, I like science fiction movies and horror movies and I just all, all this stuff. So that was all that part of me, plus the real smart ass part of me which often I won't say those things, but I'll think them real hard. Tilda says them, it's great. So that was kind of her. Now with Georgia, she's a, a mother, now she's a single mother, which I'm not, I'm quite married, um, for over 30 years. And, um, but she's got two, a teenage daughter, and I had two teenage daughters when I started on the series. And it was my, um, when I started writing the series, I was making her younger and I wasn't giving, and, and it was my editor who said, why don't you make her a little older, kind of a almost like a Gilmore Girls kind of thing, where she you know she's got a nerd daughter, a science fiction nerd daughter, because you got two of those, so you could write about that. And it's like, yeah. So she was, you know, she was a little bit older. She did have the daughter, and it was just, you know, it was, which was me at the time. At this point, since I'm on the far side of have passed sixty, um, you know, if I do another series, the, the character will probably be older. Probably not 60. I want someone who, who doesn't have as many back pro problems as I do. But, you know, you know, it's, it's just kind of, they're all me, but in different different parts of me at different times of my life. So I like them all. Um, when it comes to my short stories, I really, I, I, I meet the guy who was the pirate lawyer, he was just this unscrupulous, snotty lawyer, and he's so much fun to write. So generally, if it's a character who's kind of a smart, a smart aleck, um, those are the ones that are fun to write, mm -hmm. and and I will I will always love Sid. Yeah, that's that's who I figured. <laughs> He's definitely high up there. Yeah, that's interesting. I I've, I've heard a lot of uh, authors seem to write their characters um, who really are them um, in in some ways. It's it's uh, it's so much easier to write yourself. It <laughs> is, and it isn't. Uh, sometimes it's harder to kind of shake yourself out of reality. Uh, Dana Cameron tells a story when she was, she got into werewolves actually because of me and, and my friend Charlene Harris. We were doing an anthology of werewolf Christmas stories. And Dana was one of the first people we asked to submit. And um, she was like, oh, this is great. And she had written several mysteries, novels, and a few short stories I think maybe, maybe only one or two short stories, but the novels were about an archaeologist, which she was, and the, the short story was historical in the period she studied. Um, but this was something totally out of her experience. And she was like, I got to go get to my reference books. It's like, wait, I don't have any reference books. It's werewolves. And, you know, she had to pull herself out of that. And I think that's something that that's why writers often their first character is a lot more based on them, you know, maybe taller, maybe younger, maybe thinner or prettier, but kind of them. It's, it's, they move on, they generally start to move further apart from themselves or just a small part of themselves. One that perhaps they didn't know was there, or they didn't really want to tell anyone it was there, but it comes out in their work. Mm -hmm. I also tend to think that a, writing a novel is a very complicated thing. And with my, I had my first writing attempts were all science fiction and fantasy, and they were really bad. Trust me, they were awful. And um, 
but I started trying to write this mystery and it's like I didn't have to create the setting so I could concentrate on the characters. I didn't have to kind of come up with the language or, or vocabulary appropriate for a fantasy setting. So I could kind of just use the word there was. And I could concentrate on those things first. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, now I know how to do that. So for the next book, the plot was a lot trickier. Because it's like, all right, I know how to do this. It's like you have to walk before you can run. Mm -hmm. And it's like I had to walk as a writer before I could run and now reach for other types of characters. Interesting. So you started to write science fiction and then you changed over to mystery. I was working on it. This is, it's almost embarrassing. A friend of mine had, um, had a, I'd moved up to North Carolina, uh, to Massachusetts and had only been here, not even a year, just a few months. And I was talking to a friend of mine from North Carolina. She says, well, how's your writing going? I said, well, you know, starting the new job, getting moved in, all these changes. I haven't had that much time. And she started telling me about her friend, Pam. And how her friend Pam had finished her novel and her friend Pam was going to be sending her novel off to publishers the next week and all this about Pam and it got me mad and I was mm -hmm. just like well excuse me for breathing and I'm like okay what have I started on that I can finish darn it I'm gonna finish something and um I had started writing it was for a writing exercise for one of Lawrence Block's writing books right for your life is the name of the book it was really good and mm -hmm. um it's like well this one's different it seems to have you know I, I think I can move forward on this one but it's not fantasy and it's not science fiction I'll just it was started out just as a character study mm -hmm. and I thought well, I'll just kill somebody and make it a mystery and that's what I did I had read read a lot of mysteries not so many modern mysteries as classic mysteries mm -hmm. but I started reading the more modern stuff and kind of learned what I was supposed to do because I didn't have to worry about setting I didn't have to worry about funky language I just could write in southern idioms because that's the way I spoke, and um, go with that. Pam never told her book. <laughs> Not Pam's fault. Pam didn't brag. It was my friend. Ah, uh, interesting. So, um, so you're more of a character writer than a plot writer, then? I think so. It's the characters who come to me first. Characters and kind of yeah. in settings, and I don't mean like North Carolina. Or it's like a LARP camp or in a college. Yeah. Or, yeah theatrical production uh -huh. so like, once I've created the characters then I think of what are fun places I can put them ah uh, okay so are you more of a pantser or a outline writer totally a pantser which gets yeah. me into trouble sometimes but the other way gets me just as much trouble for I think it was book two, 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 book four tied as a tick is that right no country come to town which was set in the Boston area and mm -hmm. my editor wanted to wanted a, 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 a an outline I was like all right so I wrote up the outline and I sat it next to me and I'm like okay I'm just writing to the outline this is so easy and I it, I froze I was just like no I hate this so much so I stuck the outline in a book in a drawer and just wrote the book and if the editor ever noticed that the and if there was one scene for instance where in order to get information I was going to have okay he's going to go undercover as this and that and he's going to pretend to be gardener and I started thinking about it and it made sense in the outline and like this just in a paragraph but I actually started doing this character who had been created several books back so I had a sense of who he was I tried to make him go into that and it's like he's not that stupid no one would hire him this won't work and that's when I decided outlines aren't for me and, mm -hmm. and they're, they're great for some people and bless their hearts. I'm glad, but they don't work for me. Mm -hmm. So I shove them in the box, shove them. If I have to do one, I shove it in the drawer. The editor never says, wait a minute. And in chapter five, you have this happening. And your outline says that wouldn't happen until chapter seven. No, they don't care. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the characters kind of just go different ways. <laughs> well, you know, when you've created a character who always dresses in red, he's not going to show up dressed up in pink unless there's a reason for it. <laughs> sure. And you know, you've created the character. They who they are who they are. So what else can we expect from you in the near future? Well, I've submitted a short story to an anthology. I don't know if they'll take it, but the anthology is going to be great, whether I'm in it or not. The idea is um, a guy named Reverend Knox, K-N-O-X, Knox, was part of the, the detection club in the UK years back you know, with Agatha Christie and Dorothy Sayers and uh, G.K. Chesterton and, and people like that. And he wrote a rule, a set of rules you should not break when writing mysteries. It's like no supernatural, 
um, no hidden rooms or not too many hidden rooms and this whole set of things that would be a fair mystery. And the idea is each of us is going to break one of those rules. Uh-huh. And we're not going to say which one we're breaking because, you know, that might spoil the story. Exactly. And he's invited some really good stories. And I, I, I was happy with the way mine turned out, but I haven't heard back whether he likes it or not. But it's got to be a good anthology. And the, uh, and the editor is Jeffrey Marks. So keep an eye out for the anthology. I don't even know what they're calling it. Okay. And I'm, and I'm working on the, the, the seventh uh, family skeleton. Wonderful. And research for kind of a heist novel set among high school parents. Ah, that sounds interesting. So that'll that's what I'm going to work on after I finish with Sid. Okay, I have some questions about you being a writer. Um, okay. What is what is your favorite part of being a writer on the whole writing and publishing process? Honestly, other than the waiting, there aren't many processes I hate. I mean, I I, I like the first draft a lot. Um, I like get, I don't like getting started. <laughs> Getting started is hard for me, but once I'm in it, it's wonderful. And I absolutely adore going to the bookstore and seeing my books on the shelf. Just love it. I, yeah. I even like discussing what, the, what are going to be on the covers. I just edit. I like being edited if it's a good edit, if it's a bad edit, not so much. I like editing. I like it all except for waiting. Except for waiting. Yeah, that's that's a hard part is waiting. That's definitely a hard part. Waiting we'll for the book like to come it. out. We'll yeah. Okay, so what do you consider the most challenging part of the writing process? Getting started, getting the momentum going. I find it hard every time. And in some ways, it's become harder. Um, because if I had uh, my last book, last two books got started reviews and Publishers Weekly, and I'm like, first time that had ever happened to me in my career. And I'm like, so I'm working on this next one going, but well, what if it's not as good as the previous one? What if I don't get a start review? I'm a failure. And it's like, Calm down, calm down. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it, that, and also with each book, I have to, if, if you've heard me talk about, you know, trying to do something that other people weren't doing, I do that with myself too. It's like, well, I'm going to find a clue in a newspaper. No, I did that seven books ago. No one remembers but me that I did it seven books ago. But in my <laughs> head, I'm like, no, I've done that. I can't do that again. Mm -hmm. So what's been your favorite part about being a writer? I love meeting other writers. Oh. I absolutely love it. Um, I, I love being able to, uh, I like talking to readers too, but I, you know, it's a real sucker to be able to go, yes, I know these people. Ha -ha. And and my, my daughter gets so bored with it. Cause I would go to Barnes and Noble and, and say, I know him and I know her and I know I've met him and he's a person. And my, my, the girls are like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't care. And mm -hmm. to the point where one time I introduced a friend to my daughter and said, uh, Maggie, this is so and so. They're 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 you know they're science they're a writer, and she's like, "Mom, all your friends are writers." <laughs> yep. And you know, not wrong. Okay, so what's been your favorite adventure during your writing career? Okay, this one's weird. I, I, all these weird adventures. I really like writing the novels, but sometimes I have funky things from short stories. Uh, Carolyn Haynes, who writes a wonderful series, the only about um, set in the South called shoot what's her name i can't remember her name character but they're really charming stories and um she was going to do an anthology of mississippi delta mississippi delta noir short stories set around um uh, around jazz and mm -hmm. i had her she and charlene and i had invited her to be in one of our anthologies so she invited us back but i'm like i don't know anything about mississippi i've never been there i don't know anything about the blues and i've never written noir so of course I said, sure, because I'll do anything for the short story. And we did this wonderful anthology and um, they actually called Delta Blues and she edited it and she got some really great people in it. And the editor there was a guy, the, the, the publisher was a guy who was running Tyrus Books was the name of it, which has now unsortly disappeared. But he was going to publish it. And he said, let's do some stuff for promotion. Well, first he got decided to give a portion of the uh, proceeds to a literacy group for teaching high school students and all in Mississippi, which had fairly high mm. illiteracy rates. So it's like, okay, that's great. Let's get someone famous to write the introduction. And somehow, if they're hooked by crook, he got Morgan Freeman. Wow. 
you know, what if we had a jazz band, because several of us are musicians, and we could perform. And he set it up so that between him and Carolyn, that we would go to the Ground Zero Blues Club in Clarksdale, Mississippi, which is where the, the crossroads are. They talk about Robert Johnson and the crossroads where he sold his soul to the devil to become successful with his folk legend. And we're going to go there and perform. And for one night only, and it's like, several of us really were musicians. I mean, when we had a singer, we had a couple, of, we had a bass player, we had a drummer. And I think we, we uh, brought in a ringer or two as friends of someone who hadn't really submitted, but he was a close friend. And the rest of us were kind of background singers. <laughs> one of us could sing, I mean, really could sing. And we did a jazz performance. And so we went down, or blues, not jazz, excuse me, blues. And um, we went and spent the weekend there. We practiced in an actual recording studio, which I'd never seen one up before. And we went there, and there's, but there's videos of us on stage. If you look for, um, what was our name? Blue Muse was our name, it was our M-U-S-E Muse, and the Boomettes, mm -hmm. the background singers were the Boomettes. And that's what I did. I was a background singer. And we basically just sat there and snapped and did this Gladys and that we were the pips kind of thing. And it was so much fun. And it was just like, oh. this is never going to, you know, so I ever once in a while say, yeah, back when I was in a band, <laughs> for, you know, one weekend, but it was such a blast. Wow. That well, and sounds they got a wonderful. Event at, 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 well, I mean, they have a historic um, bus stop, a bus station. I forget why it's historic, but they had a book signing event for us there and Morgan Freeman came and gave out a writing award for high school students that we had sponsored. And so I got to shape Morgan Freeman's hand. Wow. That, I, that so is it was a, just like, yeah, that, that was that was quite the adventure for sure. I would say so. That is that is yeah. a real adventure. <laughs> so something like that, you know, that's just not gonna not something I it wasn't even on my bucket list. I I gotta say that I would like to be in a blues a jazz a blues band for one night, but <laughs> That's incredible. And I, and I learned a lot to write the short story because I had to. I had to do some serious research about the blues. Okay. So what is the greatest lesson that you've learned thus far in your writing career? Hmm. Everything changes. Um, when I first started writing and I was reading writing books and some of them were newer, most of them were a little bit older. And they all said, write short stories first editor agents will read these they will see your promising short stories they will contact you about becoming and then you will move on to novels and that was the mm. way careers worked um no i couldn't write one i couldn't write short stories until i after i wrote novels and two it's yet that's not really how it works you have to go after the agents and short stories and, and novels are different so i don't know if it was just bad advice or i think now i think times have changed you don't see agents trolling the magazines anymore um self-publishing slash indie publishing when i started out everyone was like oh, nobody does that that's vanity pressing oh that just ruined your career don't even think about it and now it's like oh absolutely a terribly a very viable way to have a career um or to, or most of us are hybrid we do some stuff self-published and we do some stuff traditionally published um audiobooks not a big deal they yeah. were just a guideline Audible came along with auto audio downloads and the other audio download, and suddenly audiobooks are huge. Yeah. Um, everything has changed, it, even if it's to the people say, well, how did you get an agent? I said, well, I can tell you how I got an agent. It will mean absolutely nothing to you because it's been too many years. Go talk to a new writer. You know? Mm -hmm. Just so much has changed in the way the industry works. Even the little things like publish publication dates. Mm -hmm. um, it used to be like when I was with Kensington for my first series, for my first eight books, they, um, they they would say the book was being released on June 1st, but then they would actually release it a month and a half earlier because June mm -hmm. would be when bookstores would take it off the shelves or they would take it off the end of June. So this gave them longer on the shelves. Mass markets as a market are almost just, is almost gone. Very few publishers are publishing in that size anymore. You know what I mean? But you know what I mean by mass market, like all mm -hmm. those books behind you. Um, but, you know, that's almost gone now. Um, Ebooks, of course, came from nowhere. And I went to a dinner for the 
publisher in chief, a very astute, knowledgeable woman, Natalie Rosenstein, and she was like, people were concerned because ebooks were just becoming a thing. It's they were like, what is this ebook? What do we do? And they're like, it's like, don't worry, it's going to be a very small sideline, like audiobooks. Which and she was wrong about ebooks, and she was wrong about audiobooks. So mm -hmm. yeah, it all changes. And just you know, don't don't say never because you don't know what's going to be coming down the dime. You don't know what the rules are going to be. Mm -hmm. True. Um, so what piece of advice would you want to share with other writers? If they're starting out, read, read like crazy and don't just read in your field. Um, you know, if you're just writing mystery, don't just read mysteries, read other books too, because you never know what's going to pop up and what's going to hit a, a chord with you. Uh, be willing to experiment because, you know, I, I do nothing about Mississippi Delta blues and or belt or Mississippi Delta boards or nor, but I did it for one story and it was great. Um, and you, and you know, was it the most successful? Did I make tons of money? Oh no, I'm sure I lost money going off for that weekend to be in the band, but it was so much fun. But be willing to experiment because you don't know what's going to hit. There was a writer who was doing pretty well in um, in uh, mysteries, adult mysteries, and he published several books and he was pretty well regarded. But his son, who was dyslexic, mm -hmm. said something about, why don't you write a book for, about kids like me? And so he came up with this fantasy setting in which the kid was, um, the dyslexia was a sign of of good thing and why where it had come from. And he wrote a book about it. And his name is Rick Riordan and the whole oh. Jackson series. If he hadn't been willing to experiment, we wouldn't have that series. Um, Charlene Harris was writing, you know, cozy mysteries, no, no paranormal at all, but she read a couple that she liked. She read uh, Laurel Hamilton's book and said, I want to try this. And mm. she bought the first Sicky Stack House, which took some time to sell and sold as a paperback original. You know, no, no fanfare at all. And look at what's happened with her since. So be willing to experiment. That's a great piece of advice. It doesn't always work. You're, you know, there's also people who try things that went absolutely nowhere. Yeah. But they're better writers as a result. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, so are there any groups, clubs, or organizations that would you'd recommend to other writers that might have helped you in your career? Well, I was a member of Sisters in Crime, mm -hmm. even at the beginning, but Sisters in Crime was not nearly as big as it is now, and they have a subgroup called the Guppies, which is great unpublished. Oh, and there's wow. a support group that help you find beta readers. I think that, it, and especially, and they do a lot of it online, so you don't have to be living any particular place or be able to travel or anything. I think they're great. I think Mystery Writers of America is very good once you're published. Um, I'm, on the, I'm on the national board, so I'm very pro Mystery Writers of America. But for a, an unpublished writer, you can take advantage of the meetings and things and be an associate member and go to your local chapter members meetings and learn a whole lot because they often have speakers about forensics or about the field. So MWA is also very good. Both Sisters in Crime and MWA. Um, if you're a person of color, Crime Writers of Color is an incredible support system. I'm not a member of that because I'm pretty darn white bread, but they're wonderful. And I believe there's a queer crime writers group as all they can also support because there's a lot of markets for, uh, for LGBTQ fiction that sometimes the average mystery reader doesn't know about. But and people, and it's, it's a shame because they're kind of ghetto to, that the average mystery reader will hear about, but they're great markets if you're writing in that field. Hmm. Interesting. Those. There's also science fiction writers of America. There's romance writers of America, which is very helpful for new writers. So, yeah, there's a lot of them out there. I mean, there's also you know, various workshops and conventions, and even a lot of bookstores have a, a writer's group. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you have one or not. But. No, not at the moment. Yeah, I, I mainly see it at like, uh, Barnes and Nobles, and the problem with them is that all kinds of writers will come together, and it's like, and you've got a poet, and a nonfiction, and a fiction, and yeah, they're all writers, but it may not be the best, most concrete of, of, of advice, but it's a place to start. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, now I have questions about you as a person. Oh no. What is, <laughs> what is one thing that most people don't realize about you? Ah, do, 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 do. Well, they've noticed that I'm short, so we're going to let that one go. 
<laughs> for many years, I let's see, I've been teaching myself to pick locks. Which okay. Is a lot of fun. Um, and I had a mutant ability to find four leaf clovers. It's not a useful skill, I admit, but it could I, be fun. <laughs> Does it work? Um, I, I never have been able to decide if, if I use up the luck finding up the four, finding the four leaf clover. <laughs> I mean, is it say finding a four leaf clover makes you lucky, or is it you have to be lucky to find a four leaf clover? I've never been sure which is true. But I've had a pretty lucky life, so I can't complain. Oh, good, good. Uh, what question um, would you wish interviewers would ask you, and what would your answer be? This is a hard one, I know. It's a hard one, it is, isn't it? Um, mm -hmm. Do, 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 do. I always like being asked, I, I kind of hate both the hate and love being asked about my favorite writers because it shifts so much depending on what I'm reading. Yeah. But there's always people I love talking about who may not be as well known as others. So that's kind of a mixed one. Um, I'm always happy to talk about my kids. I just don't know that it really is terribly applicable or that my <laughs> kids like it. <laughs> so you know, who are I, your favorite writers? Right now? Let's see, I've been reading a lot of Julian May, who was a science fiction writer a few years back. Um, I think she's passed away these days. Um, Dorothy Gilman, who wrote the Mrs. Polifax novels, which I think are kind of obscure now, but she's a former Grandmaster MWA, and I actually had to read a piece about her for the uh, Mystery Writers of America annual this year. Okay. Uh, your, okay, your picture was frozen for a second, but it's okay oh, now. Oh, there we go. Uh, where, did we, where did I leave off? Dorothy Gilman, or, or did the voice keep going? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, let's see, who have I been reading lately? I'm looking around to see what I've been reading. Since I'm in first draft mode, I tend to be in a reread mode rather than reading something new. Mm -hmm. When I'm writing on, when I, it's hard for me to read something new when I'm trying to write my own stuff. I can reread like crazy, but I can't write new. Mm -hmm. uh, see. Rex Stout. Mm. And I've got a new book from Naomi Novik, which I think I'm going to read, part of her School of Mance series. So that's, those, those are some. And of course, Charlene Harris, Dana Cameron, excellent. Okay. So what is or are your passions uh, when you're not writing? And how do you make time to do the things that you love? Yeah, I think most people manage to find time for things for their loves that they're not finding time for, but maybe they don't love it as much as they think they should. Um, I do a lot of online uh, uh, computer gaming and I shift between which are my favorite games. Currently I've been playing a Disney game called Dreamlight Valley, which is an early release. It's, it's kind of like Animal Crossing. It's a cozy game. You're not fighting or, any, or solving. You solve minor puzzles, but not big puzzles. Um, I, pl I like to watch. I like movies and TV a lot. My husband and I just finished watching all six seasons of Lucifer. <laughs> which I liked, we enjoyed a whole lot. It was much better than we expected. We had read mm -hmm. the comic on which it's based loosely, but when it was coming out. So we were delightfully surprised by how much we enjoyed that. Um, and Poker Face, which we thought was wonderful. Um, so gaming, TV, and of course, reading. Mm hmm Okay. Um, and uh, what are some of your writing related hobbies or crafts? Writing related well, learning to pick locks was definitely inspired. Um, I'm not sure what a writing related hobby would be other than I guess it would be I guess it would be reading, and you've already reading answered that. Researching, um, I've been reading a lot about heists in, in kind of in, in preparation for this heist novel I want to write. Okay. And, and real life heists are not usually nearly as clever as they were in Ocean's Eleven, which is really a disappointment. But every once in a while, you run into one that is exactly that smart. Oh yeah, do you have one in particular? Um, I can't, you know, I'm trying to remember the details because I read a whole bunch at once. But uh -huh. when you know, well, they were like sneak in and hide in bathrooms, and I haven't seen anyone coming down from the ceiling yet, but I'm sure there were. But a lot of times they just kind of walk in and walk off with the thing, and people are like, "Did did he just steal the Vermeer? Yes, he did. I think it's, I think Sid is sitting there listening to you. Is he better? Yes. Yeah, he pops up <laughs> everywhere. I have a lot of SIDs. I have SIDs all over my desk. 
Oh, do you? I guess that would be Which, a writing related thing is collecting skeleton stuff. Okay. Yeah, it, it would be. And actually, my next question is, what does your writing space look like? <laughs> a mess. Um, <laughs> let's see. I've got a big desk, but it's an old fashioned desk. So it's not really built for a computer. Um, and it's about <laughs> that wide. <laughs> um, it's covered with books and stacks of papers and this which Ooh. is this is not a real dagger it's, it's foam it was a christmas present from my daughters they know me <laughs> well um i've got a skull i've got a tiara it was a gift oh this is my one of my favorite skeletons right now any cute oh, yes a christmas ornament oh hi uh, it's, it, although disney did a bunch of early cartoons before they did Mickey Mouse and one of them was the Silly Symphonies and this was the first one Skeleton Dance ah. so so it's you know I I you can see the mess behind me that's my husband's desk behind us so we share an office he, he politely had to make a phone call of his own so he's in the other room the room is full of books also to my right it looks kind of like what's behind you lines of bookshelves with all our books well most of our books <laughs> and let's see i'm in the corner room on my wall i've got my because i'm a total snot i have all my award nominations framed so i can look at them and feel smug <laughs> and i have a picture of a cross stitch of mickey mouse an edward gory print a dragon print i don't know where that came from i don't remember the provenance that it was a gift and from a science fiction novel a picture from um, kelly freeze who's a science fiction artist oh, wow Okay. And um, is there any particular drink that you might uh, might have while you're writing a uh, drink or food or anything like that? It's a lot of iced tea because Southerner. And um, Diet Dr. Pepper is what I've got now in my, my skeleton glass. I don't know if you can see it because it's kind of light. Yep. But uh, my daughter gave these to me. My daughter did the design. Oh, really? Huh. If you go to my website, actually, which is Lee Perry, uh, Lee Perry author .com, um, there's a couple of animations that my daughter did because that's her that's her training. She's an animator and graphic artist. So she does most of my artwork and stuff for me. Oh, nice. And in one of them, which is kind of a uh, redid the, the lyrics to I want a hippopotamus for Christmas. And did I want a sleuthing skeleton for Christmas? And my daughter animated that. We had kind of the bouncing ball. And my other daughter, Valerie, does the singing for it. Oh, wow. So it's not just research work I get from my kids. I put them to work. Ah, it sounds like it. <laughs> and my husband's a beta reader. We're all very supportive. So what, when you're writing, um, speaking of music, uh, do you have, do you need to have silence or do you listen to music? And if you listen to music, what kind? I can't listen to music. Sometimes I'll listen to something to kind of get me in the mood, and that varies by the book. Um, I know people who have to create a playlist for a book before they'll start the book, and I just, I'm hard of hearing. So for it to be loud enough for me to hear it and not just be, is too distracting. If I have it too low, it's, I either don't hear it or it's just kind of background noise. So I prefer quiet. It doesn't have to be absolute silence. People can wander around, but just don't talk to me for God's sake okay so, but you know i could um, I've, I've written in like coffee shops and stuff like that that kind of background is fine but not music okay um and authors often have furry or feathered or otherwise non-human companions to help or help them with their work and do you have any and do they help or hinder you well i've got my horse <laughs> yes um no we we had guinea pigs for many years but our last guinea pig passed away a few years back, and so we don't have any. We no longer have pets. I grew up with dogs, but not anymore. Ah, uh, okay. Um, I have two more questions for you. Actually, three. One is, um, how important is the New England setting to your uh, to your work? Um, it depends on the book, but with the family skeleton, very much so, because they're all set in or around colleges, and England has the best selection of colleges nearby. Uh, people writing mysteries talk about Jessica uh, Jessica Fletcher syndrome and murder she wrote where it's like every time she goes somewhere someone's murdered and if you keep someone living in a small town which is kind of the favorite setting 
you know, you're going to run out of people to kill. Or if someone move, new moves to town, you know, well, they're going to get killed. Um, so <laughs> I have, so I have, as part of being an adjunct English professor, that means Georgia has no, uh, no tenure, not even a decent contract other than semester to semester. So she kind of has to wander around to different colleges and there's no better place on earth than New England for having lots of colleges and lots of different kinds of schools. So one ah. time she was a business school, one time she was an art school, uh, a teaching college, all these different kinds that I can stick in New England. So for that, it's really very important. Ah, yeah, that's, that is very true. Um, okay, my last two questions. Where can people find your work? Aside from Annie's book, Stop of Worcester, and uh, I have to do a plug for Annie's. You can buy, uh, <laughs> you, you can buy uh, Tony or or. Um, Lee Perry's work uh, at Annie's. If you call us at 508-796-5613, or you can email us at orders at anniesbooksworcester.com. And where else can people find your work? I just want to say, you shouldn't just email and call Annie's. Go in there because you will find all kinds of cool stuff you didn't know existed. That's the, that's the joy of a, of a used bookstore. Um, and see... I'm in the usual places like um, Amazon and Barnes and Noble online. Not as much in the stores as well, because it's been a long time. It's been a while since I've had a, a new novel come out. So you know they don't they, their, their institutional memory is not very long. Um, but the online places and lots of mystery booksellers will carry me forever, like which I really appreciate. Okay, and my last question is: How can we follow your work and share your awesomeness? Um. Well, don't follow me too, or I don't go very many places. But uh, online, let's see, I've got TonyLPKellner.com and then also LeePerryAuthor.com. Uh, so one for each name. I'm on Facebook under both names, and I've got an Instagram, which is do to do Lee Perry Author on Instagram. Okay. So I'm pretty easy to find. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much. And hopefully we will be having you at our store um, when your next novel comes out or next short story. I will add it to my list. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Lee Perry, L.P. Kellner. Thanks, Elena. And uh, we'll be talking to you.